Welcome to the Business Chat podcast and today I'm really delighted to have Andrew Bull as my guest who is hailing all the way from Essex in the UK. Welcome to the show, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me today, Lisa. You're welcome. And I discovered you, as I discover many guests, through your own uh, podcast. What's the name of your podcast? It's called The Interstellar Business Show. The Interstellar Business Show. And your business is called The Interstellar Way of Life. We'll be hearing more about that in a moment. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy the the diversity of guests that you have on your show. Really, really great topics and really relevant for people in business sort of wherever they, they are. Uh, Andrew, you began your career in the film industry. Tell us a bit about that, some of the highlights. Oh, yeah, I did. You know what? The film industry is something that I worked very hard to get into, like, knocking on a lot of doors to get in there and I was really fortunate to have those doors open to me and to end up working on some big projects like Moulin Rouge, Harry Potter, um, Phantom of the Opera, Sherlock Holmes, 300, all these kind of big movies and a load of commercials as well and I got to travel the world a bit and we were talking just before we came on uh, about how I got to travel to Australia and places like this, which is which is great, is is really cool, and uh, the work was very interesting. It was never dull, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll bet. So, did you know from an early age, like when you were in school, that you always wanted to get into the film industry? Oh well, I my first love was photography and visuals, and yeah. I was I I had my mindset on becoming a director of photography. So the person yeah. who really shapes the camera work and lighting on films. Uh, and I still love photography now. Uh, and But I kind of stumbled in, it, I kind of went into that area, but I ended up working in trick photography for films. So how we, you know, not er, everyone thinks a lot of what is done is all uh, CGI and computer graphics, but actually there's a lot of trick photography that goes on as well, which which is combined with the CGI stuff but also can be more or less standalone in, try, you know, mm. doing stuff and showing things which you think aren't possible. And yeah, I kind of stumbled into that in the film industry, which was cool. Yeah, yeah it was fun. That sounds like it's a really specialised area. Never even heard of that before. I just assumed it was all like photoshopped and stuck together by software. That's awesome. Yeah, I think you'll find most of the time filmmakers will try and film something that's real in every shot if they can. So that's yeah. often where you get this trick photography and like it does actually make things hang together, hang together more. Yeah, it was a good thing to get involved in, but it was very specialist. And I did feel as I was deeper into it that I kind of felt a little bit cornered at times through that special, right. you know, through being quite so specialised as well. It's not you know, my brother's a maths teacher and it's much easier for him to jump from, you know, region to region, job to job. Whereas when you're working a very special thing, much harder. Yeah. And was there a particular defining moment, Andrew, when you decided to make a big career leap or was it more slow and organic? Uh, no, there was a couple of things came to a head. I think uh, I got to a point where I'd reached... I'd maxed out my role in the film industry in terms of what I could do. And the challenges remaining were to do mainly with the crazy schedules that we were being uh, asked to work to, which were getting crazier and crazier. And then um, I think I came to a time in my life as well where I want to have a family. And when you're working in the film industry, you go to work, you're on set at half seven in the morning, and then you don't know what time you're coming home at. And that might be for a couple of days or a couple of weeks like that at a time, or maybe even months. Not very family friendly. So I was like, uh, it's, I want to do something different now. I want to, I want a job where I'm in more control. I can have a social life, see my friends and family and so on. So you became a business owner. That's right. Yeah. Just to like have a bit more control over my life rather than yeah. be dictated to like, you know, where I was going to go and, who I was going to be working with yeah. all the time. Yeah. 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 So so tell us about your your business, the Interstellar Way of Life. It sounds very intriguing. Love to know how you came about the name and what you're doing in your business. 
Okay, so uh, when I first decided to walk away from the film industry, I didn't uh, just jump into working on team performance. Uh, actually, my first thing was to start out in some kind of marketing business, uh, doing marketing projects for people and uh, to, to begin with quite video focused and then it became more broadly focused on marketing. Uh, and But what I realized while I was working on all these marketing projects, that no matter how good an idea is, um, that if you don't have people willing to execute it, willing to perform at a high level, then the ideas never get completed. They never get over the finish line uh, or the project just runs out of steam and people turn around and look at each other and go, well, why hasn't this worked out? And so really the interstellar way dot life uh, has evolved from that so it's all focused on about team performance and leadership performance to some extent as well and really looking at how we can perform at a higher level so that we can execute all this cool stuff like great marketing campaigns or developing new products or just you know getting home from work at a decent time because if you're, if you're not working at a good potential then actually your day just runs on and on and and so you know, yeah. there's the whole philosophy I have with interstellar stellar way of life is not just about helping businesses grow faster and better. It's about helping people perform in all areas of life because I see them as as uh, inseparable. And I, yeah. I think that's been really uh, made even clearer over the last 24 months with what we've gone through with yeah. COVID, that people yeah. are now working at home those barriers between work and business have just like crumbled. And so you can't just be like, oh, here's my work, here's my home life. These are two separate things. They they, they collide. And so we have to be smarter. I need like a, a more, uh, a smarter philosophy uh, to how we perform in, in both these areas of our life. That That's kind of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so what... Um what makes a team underperform you know people don't get up in the morning go to work and go you know what i'm not going to try hard today like is it leadership is it the environment is it the system what what causes poor performance in teams and secondly what's the cost to the organization when teams are underperforming well i think the first immediate one is people are going to get less done so uh like you might see that people get lots of shallow tasks done during a day and they're doing lots of busy work but they don't achieve anything or maybe they just disappear to the coffee shop a lot, a lot. so that could be the first one lack of productivity and then you could have th things like issues with uh, sales being affected um, yeah. because even even if you're talking about a wider team, say like a team of IT people and they're not all what you call traditional sales people they're all going to have like a sales edge to what they're doing because they're going to be interacting with customers and they've got opportunities to help your company grow or retain revenue. So that, that could be, that could be something that's, that's going to be affected by poor team performance. And here's a really big one. You're going to have more friction amongst your team uh, members mm -hmm. because um, I don't know if you're familiar with Alfred Adler, Lisa at all. No. So, so he's like a philosopher, stroke psychiatrist, I suppose. You know, uh, a rival to to many of these great thinkers like Sigmund Freud and all these kind of peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that all problems are interpersonal problems. And I think that that's that's got such a key um, that can be such a key area, which can be a problem, a challenge for businesses and teams or a, a thing of strength. So let me let me try and add some clarity and not muddle things up too much here. But, you know, if we can't speak well as a team and communicate well as a team and we've always got friction and not talking well over email and then maybe even carrying that onto our customers or our partners, then we're going to keep hitting lots of hurdles in our businesses. The working day is going to be harder. People aren't going to want to work for each other. Um, and so, yeah, personal relationships is also something which can be either a strength or a weakness uh, in, in, yeah. business, in business. Um, and just, just a couple more points of where it can hurt the business per, uh, and the leader personally is if your team's not performing well, 
then everything is going to fall on the leader or the leader's shoulders, right? Everything has to come back through that leader. Um, and so that means they're going to have to work longer hours. They're going to be stuck in the office. They're going to be stressing more, working, working more and having less time with their family and doing the things that they love. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's many costs to team performance. I won't go into too many more because you probably, you probably don't want me to go into too many right now. No, it's fascinating. And I'd also imagine that, you know, it would cause a lot of uh, stress and burnout and workplace absenteeism. And I read recently that that psychological injuries now outweigh physical injuries in workplaces. So a lot of workplaces are quite toxic for our mental health. So I'd imagine that if you've got an underperforming team who are not communicating well, who are not motivated, who are doing less than they could because they're not performing at their best, then that could lead to depression and anxiety and those kinds of things as well, which is not good for any anyone. 100% Lisa that's you're you're absolutely right and well wellness is a thing that we need to consider uh both from a human perspective that we care about our people that we want them to be well but and also from a, from a business perspective that if people are sick because they're stressed they're not going to be in the office doing work so there's yeah. that that's another reason that team performance can really hurt the business and over time people will will leave the business if you're consistently stressed in a business and not enjoying it you're just going to quit so again there's a talent retention problem as well if your business aren't performing well yeah yeah so so now let's talk uh, more positively and let's talk about the winning team the successful team the high performing cohesive team what are what are their qualities and strengths and, and what does that team look like andrew so i'd say ownership is a big thing i'd say yeah. teams who are willing to own their challenges and their problems and take hold of their future and i think it's actually been proven to make people happier and uh more engaged and um and actually remove them away from stress and depression actually ownership as well they've done experiments on this and prove this so ownership is not only good for the individual's wellness but also good for good for the business because the leader doesn't have to do as much but also yeah. it means that the team members are really engaged what they're doing and when do when things do go wrong they they are able to step up and go look we made a mistake this didn't work out uh but we're going to fix it and and when team members are able to do that you've got a much healthier uh and more robust business yeah um, yeah uh, and i think confidence is a big one as well yeah so they, they feel they feel like they've got the skills and ability and the right resources to be able to do the job so that would go back to training and and development as well it, yeah, yeah training and development definitely but it's also a uh, mindset as well uh, yeah. because i think that when we leave school college and university we have a certain set of skills maths english accounting it these kind of things that we might know really well but there's a whole load of other skills that we're short on which could be things like organizing your day or it could just be having the confidence in yourself to not worry too much about what other people think about you and feeling yeah. like having the mental strength to try something like say a business mm. wanted to try and do a podcast, right? Yeah. Um, having the mental strength to try and do a podcast and for the first couple of episodes to be a bit naff, yeah. but to have that courage and confidence to pick up, you know, pick it up and carry on going forward. So I think these are some of the, yeah. the, the critical things that we need to have. Yeah, definitely. So not only uh, owning any mistakes that you make, but also growing and learning from those mistakes so that you're in a culture of continuous improvement and wanting to learn, being curious, innovating. And you can only do that if you feel safe and if you feel supported. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be backed up by your team and your leader, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
how does a leader continue to motivate a team? So let's say they've managed to develop a, a team who are performing well, they're, they're productive, they're motivated, they love coming to work and everything's going well. But you know, we're in this, we're in this massive period of rapid change and, and uncertainty. So what, what skills and tools do you equip leaders with to help them to continue to, to keep their team at that level? I think the first thing is that leaders need to be aware of their own leadership style and they need to be mm. accepting of their leadership style. Because I think this is a big, uh, a big challenge a lot of leaders and organizations have that leaders don't always have clarity on their style. And I think different styles are okay and definitely in different contexts are completely fine. For example, if you run a um, like a retail business, it might need to be a lot more of a managerial style where people have very fixed roles and schedules. Whereas if you worked in an IT company where you're developing things fast, you might need to have more of a uh, empowering leadership style where people are given free reign to develop bits and pieces. But I think what team members are really looking for is consistency from leaders and I think it's very confusing when they don't get that consistency that one day they're told that they strictly need to be doing these five things and then, mm. then the next day they'd be told why didn't you use your initiative so I think leaders need to get clarity and accept and and get consistency with that uh, and and communicate that to their team but I would say if we're talking about how teams can continue to innovate and um then I think it really is about empowering team members to do that and giving them the tools and resources and, mm. and support to do, to, to do it. But I think true motivation comes from inside the person. It doesn't come from money mm. or discipline. Of course, those things help to an extent. But there is, you know, it's been proven that after a certain point, after you've got so much money, that actually the effect of money starts to wear off. And mm. things like discipline as well, like shouting at people or maybe some more subtle kind of disciplining people doesn't actually work over the long term either because you're going to start sowing seeds of negativity as well. So really what you need to do is level up your team members mindset and skill set and, and yep. lead them towards taking responsibility for their own results. Um, that's not going to work with every team member. So this is where it, this is where it gets hard. You know, we have this thing, the what I like to call the tension crisis, right? Where we expect things always to be absolute, right? We, yeah. You know, everyone can be empowered and they'll all be fine. But the reality is not everyone works like that. So that's where it gets a bit harder. And leaders need to do a bit of work to actually work out who needs to be managed a bit more. Or maybe be a bit smarter when they're hiring in the first place to make sure they don't get those people into their businesses who need to be managed so much and who can take on that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. What about the importance, Andrew, of reward and, and recognition? I think that is important that you that that, you know, people should be rewarded for hard work and you should um, you should make clear make clear that people are doing well in the business and make a bit of a show of those people uh, to everyone and hold them up as leading lights in your team. Um, but that shouldn't be the, but you know, the bonus culture shouldn't be the be all and end all because you yeah. can, I think you can create some weird dynamics as well, mm -hmm. like where people mm -hmm. could be sacrificing everything just to get their bonuses. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was thinking I, more of those sort of little, little um, acknowledgement and showing appreciation. You know, sometimes I've had managers who, you know, barely say thank you or well done or, you know, great for going that extra mile. And sometimes it doesn't have to be huge. It just needs to be an acknowledgement. And, you know, some leaders are, are, are very quick to to say something if it's not right. But it's it's that giving that those daily, you know, that daily dose of gratitude, I think. So just say I, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think thank you is it is so powerful. I think you're 100 percent right. Thank you is hugely, hugely powerful. And here's something that leaders who are listening to the show can do this week, this Friday and every Friday from now on. 
make a point of appreciating what you and your team have have achieved for the week and that's an opportunity for you to say thank you for your team members for what they've done to to help people see that they're making progress because this is also a challenge that we have that sometimes we're so busy jumping from project to project that we don't actually step back and go oh look we've actually achieved something because we're already moving on to the next project so make friday your appreciation day I love that. That's so simple and yet uh, effective. I think that's that's brilliant. So, Andrew, uh, tell us a bit more about your methodology and how you go about working with teams and your particular model that you have developed. Yeah, so the, the model is called the GROW system, which is ba which is an abbreviation of growing, working and living smart, smarter. And also the GROW is a bit like uh, I see it as a wolf grabbing hold of their life like it's kind of aggressively Ooh. like let's do this and grab hold of our futures uh, so the growl system is designed to help teams unlock their potential and the way we do that is first of all i meet with a leader work out what they're trying to achieve with their business and their team uh, then possibly do a bit of work helping the team work on their leader uh, helping the leader work on their leadership style and any other things which are going to stop the, the team members performing. So for example, we might have to make sure they've got a system of accountability in place in the organization um, and a way of, of, of checking on team members' progress. Because if you don't check on people's progress, it makes it seem like you don't care about what they're doing. That's the reality. And again, this is a common yeah. mistake that people make. Then after we've got those kind of fundamental things in place with the organization and leader, we then run training workshops for the team members on things like um, ownership, owning your future. So this is a big thing. We like to give mm -hmm. team members the keys, the keys to their car. Right. So if we think mm. about how big a thing it is when you're in your in your teens or early 20s, you're given the first mm -hmm. keys to your car. It's amazing. It's so empowering because you're in control of where you're going. So this is a huge thing that we do. We help people really understand that they control their results and what they get within the business. And let's face it, even if um, you take the you take hold of those keys and you develop yourself and you really push yourself forward. And even if the business doesn't respond to you, if you've taken yourself as a person to the next level, you will be rewarded, whether it's in your current business or another business. So you really do need to yeah. own your future to get those rewards. Uh, and then we help them on things like dominating their day. So, they, so they're in more control of their mm. daily productivity. Uh, communication yeah. is a big one as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, being able to listen to other people, which is mm -hmm. which is a huge one. People mm -hmm. people are pretty bad at listening in general. Um, that's a yeah. common one. And yeah, various other topics like that. We run these individual workshops for the leaders. Right. Sounds like it's an all round personal and professional development that will help the individual throughout their life rather than just that particular role, which is which is awesome. Yes, yes, that, that's exactly, that's exactly, this is all part of my philosophy of people like, uh, you know, leveling up in business and in yeah. life. Because I see the things as being like a, a circle, right? The better you perform in your business, the better you're going to perform in your life and vice versa. So if I, if, for example, if I go to work and I work too late, then I'm not, at high, then I don't get to spend time with my kids in the evening. And then I'm probably going to stay up too late watching TV because I need to unwind and then I'm going to be tired the next day and I'm going to have a poor day at work. So it's, it's all related. And this is what we have to have to realize. It's, we can't really neatly separate these things anymore. So that's all part of my philosophy, the interstellar yeah. way of life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and self-care is just so important, isn't it? It's really important. And one of the things that I learned from from COVID, uh, a couple of uh, you know really important lessons came out of COVID is that I was spending way too many nights in hotels and airports and planes and and traveling around, which you know at the time I loved, but it was when all that stopped suddenly that I thought, you know what, I I I like my own bed and my house, and I like the fact that I'm on the same time zone. And maybe I do need to to slow down. So I began to practice a, a daily and weekly discipline of actually 
scheduling in self-care into my diary before I let my diary out to my my clients. And, you know, as we know by the research and just how we feel in ourselves, if we're not if we're not doing the self-care, then we're not turning up as our best possible self in order to serve others. And yet for, you know, how many years have we burned the candle at both ends and thought that we could still do a great job and just doesn't happen. So I love these, the, the business leaders who are really seeing the importance of play, of creativity in the workplace, and also that, that concept of nothingness about allowing people to do nothing. <laughs> Sounds yeah. very counterproductive, doesn't it? But the results it's are not, there. Though. Yeah, yeah, you're mm. right. Doing it's like it's like just switching off and going for a walk for like half hour, mm. not thinking about anything. It's hugely powerful. You're right. Yeah, and often you get you get really good ideas during those moments of of downtime or change in scenery. Yeah. So your model, Growl, G-R-O-W-L, stands for growing. Say that again. Growing, working, and living smarter. Wow. So it really is like those, holistic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I see those as the three areas because mm. from a business leader's point of perspective and also hopefully from a team member's perspective, you want to grow the business or sustain, yeah. or at least sustain it. And then you've got your day-to-day -day job, like your profession, like your vocation. So that's the work. And then you've obviously got your life, the living. Mm. What sort of industries do you work with, Andrew? Do you work with a particular industry or do you help people across all industries? That's a great question. Uh, mainly IT and marketing. Those teams seem to be mm. the, the ones. So very technology-based teams, desk-based teams, because I work remotely. Uh, yeah. I'm not currently looking to go out and tour the world because I want, you know, I prefer this mm. way of working. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And what sort of, have you got any, any small um, examples or case studies you can share of like before and after the results that people got from in increasing their motivation after working yeah. with you? Sure. Yeah. I've got one on my website that people can check out if they click on the, if they head to my website at interstellarway.life and click on team mm -hmm. training and just follow the link, you'll see there's some uh, testimonials and you can learn about uh, how I actually help people. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. So what's next for you? Have you what, What's on the horizon? Have you got like a big goal or yeah, something that you're big, looking forward to? Yeah, a big goal. Yeah. Uh, it's publishing my book called The Monsters of Team performance so that I'm working wow, on what a title <laughs> yeah so that I've got 60,000 words written and I need to probably write another 10 and then like really polish it up a bit and then that will wow. be coming out yeah well done look congratulations writing a book is so so hard and yeah the saying goes we've all got a book in us and yet only a small percentage actually write that book because it's darn hard and having that discipline to write yeah, 60,000, that is a lot of words. Congratulations on uh, doing that so far. The hardest part's done now. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got to edit it, but yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I'm, no, I'm really looking forward to that because um, it's not just words. It's also pictures. My crazy uh, whiteboard drawings are going into that as Brilliant. well. To make it more, yeah. To make it more engaging and fun, right? That's, that's yeah that's it. it's got to be fun it's got to be fun yeah and you're po how long have you been podcasting for andrew uh probably a, a bit under two years now it's been a bit sporadic i have to say yeah. because i've had quite a few challenges like my son is five years old and i've had quite a few challenges with covid in terms of everything yeah. being shut and my son being mm -hmm. at home but yeah i want to be more consistent with my podcast and i also want to um try out different things in my show i would like to do i quite li personally i quite listen to football podcasts quite a lot they really they have like four right, or five yeah. people on those talking mm -hmm. i actually would quite like to try out that kind of style as well where we have more more people and more voices talking about one topic so i think i'll give that a go right yeah that sounds that sounds so awesome well congratulations two years is 
is uh, pretty ma massive in the podcasting world. We've all heard of pod fade where people do, you know, bang out six episodes and then realize that, you know, it, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of resources to be able to do it, it properly. But the rewarding part is this part, getting to sit and and chat and we're on Zoom, we can see one another to someone across the the other side of the world and have a conversation about something that interests us both is just uh, is just wonderful. Makes all the hard work seem worthwhile. It so so does. How, how long's your show been going for, Lisa? I only started my show in February. So having a podcast is one of the things that was on my vision board. But at the time, two years ago, when I I first thought, yeah, I'm going to get a podcast. I didn't really have a, a strategy. So the why wasn't strong enough. I knew I wanted to do it and I had the resources and I kept coming back to that, you know, why? Because I knew that it was going to be a lot of work. So I did some other things in, in the meantime. I carried on speaking and coaching and training. But I also decided to set myself a goal to be on as many other people's podcasts as possible. And in that process of being a guest for almost a year, before doing my own show was I was really able to work out what I liked and what I didn't like in terms of style, of, of, of uh, presenter, of production, and then really put that all in the mix when I considered mine. Yeah. So February it's, it started and I'm loving the journey. Absolutely loving the journey. I've got, uh, uh, weekly, I'm I'm putting it out weekly, and uh, having really nice conversations, and, and hopefully adding value to the clients that I come across, and, and and saying, hey, you might want to listen to you know this week's episode or last week's episode, or I've got somebody somebody coming up who's an expert on this. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to um, I like the the audio format as well because it's something people can listen to on the run or in bed or wherever it's so versatile absolutely yeah. podcasting po podcasts are like a mobile university and the information is often i mean often by the time a book's published a lot of that information is is old if the, if the book's been years in the making but you can listen to a, a podcast a new episode and it's current and it's relevant and it's topical and yeah before covid when i was doing a lot of traveling i probably would have averaged 15 up to 20 hours a week of of podcasting i don't read read books i listen to to the content now it's probably sort of 10 to 12 but oh look i know which days my favorite podcasts drop and i'm pretty much addicted to podcasts and i just love it it's something really quite intimate at having a a conversation between two people or even a solo episode you know in your ear uh, particularly if you resonate with that and you're like, ah, oh. so mine are, uh, my preferences are all sort of business and personal development, but I do have, um, I do have a weak spot for true crime, particularly UK true crime. So there's the murder mile and there is, they walk among us. Oh, I'm just hooked on that show. <laughs> oh, wow. Can't okay. Wait. Yeah. Some really out. good. Yeah, really good. Uh, I think a lot of it's in the narration with true crime. It's the narration. And look, I must say apologies to uh, our American friends listening, but I'm not a fan of the American style where, you know, you've got the eerie music. I mean, you'd appreciate this being from film and you've got the over dramatization, whereas the English narrators just sort of read it and and still make it sound interesting but the, without all the bells and whistles <laughs> yeah yeah i get yeah so it might, yeah i guess it's horses for courses and yeah it depends on your taste but yeah i can see that like you like the more realistic approach to it yeah yeah exactly you know the facts and uh yeah yeah awesome so uh, andrew how can people find out about you i know you've mentioned your your website before so i mentioned your website and your your uh, podcast again so that people really know where to jump on to get all your wonderful information okay you can head over to interstellarway.life that's the website address uh, and there you find my blog, uh, you can find my podcast, which is called The Interstellar Business Show, which is available on Spotify and all those normal places. Uh, and there's also some free resources you can grab on team training on my site as well. So those are very Brilliant. easy to find. 
Oh, fabulous. That's awesome. Two questions that I like to finish with. This is the only part of the podcast that's that's scripted. And that is uh, the first question is a mantra that you live by a quote or a mantra that you live by. Well, I think own your future is a big one. I think that's that's a huge one. I think that comes back to uh, the, the, the where I got inspired by the name Interstellar was actually from the film. And thinking about the journey that the Matthew McConaughey went on, where he went on this amazing adventure, let's call it the business mission. And then at the end of the business mission, he turns around and his daughter is suddenly an old lady because he's been so consumed mm. by the business mission. So part of what I want to help people to do is own their future so they don't turn around and realize that life mm. has flown flown by so that's why i say yes. own your future so that's a big mantra for me. yeah that's that's powerful we've all got we've all got uh, the choice and we make our own choices and uh, yeah that's a powerful image all of a sudden realizing your daughter's grown up and you haven't been around because you've been spending too much time at work yeah powerful exactly. stuff yeah and a business book a book that maybe is on your shelf that you refer to often that you think will be a great addition for any business owner yeah the book that i've got is just it's the lost art of listening um, oh, wonderful which is book. A, yeah it's a brilliant book because i think even though i used to consider myself an okay listener um i realized from reading this book actually how much more could be done in in when it comes to to listing and i think it's even though it's not a business book uh i think if you're a leader or even someone who wants to be a better human being or you work in sales then this book could be so powerful for you because you'll be able to connect with people on a much deeper level and for once in their lives they'll actually feel like someone is listening to them which could be amazing yeah Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew Ball, for being my guest today on the Business Chat Podcast.